else feel that? Didn't it feel weird? Something isn't quite right. Do you know what it was? That video, this one you're watching right now, kicked off without a squam, 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 or even a blokey banger from all of our friend Tom Rosenfeld. None of that just happened. And doesn't that feel weird? It doesn't feel right. And it kind of makes the point. That was my biggest problem with the film 100 Streets, about which we shall be talking right now. Because that film doesn't have any opening studio logos. Now, none of us really care what massive intergalactic corporation made this film, and yet there's something really nice about a film beginning and a seeing a big globe light up, or seeing a, a woman do a lamp, or, 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 or a mountain exist and some stars fly around it, or a lion roar, or like a castle shine in the distance, or like a, 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 another lamp come along and just absolutely murder the eye that slept with its wife, that it hates that eye so much and it wants it dead. It kind of provides a mental breathing space, a bookmark, a symbol that what you're watching, we're about to watch, is a film. It's like the moment you can kind of switch over and go, okay, what I'm watching now is art. It matters. It lets your brain move from one space to the next. It tells you what you're watching is a film, it's a work of art, something important, in just the same way that the, the, the daft noise that's on my videos tells you that I never expected to ever hit 100k subs. And 100 Streets doesn't have that. This is because the film's entire budget was raised by writer Leon Butler through private equity, which is the most English rugby film production story I've ever heard. So, 100 Streets, the film we're going to be talking about today, tells a number of stories, but at heart, and especially if you watch any of the marketing which exclusively follows this one story, the one that has the two big stars in it, is the tale of Max Moore, an England rugby legend, number eight, captain, does a bunch of charity shit now, only his life after retiring begins to fall apart when he he, he loves cocaine, right? And he does loads of it, and he starts bragging about it, and he starts cheating on his wife all the time, and doing all this shitty stuff involving sleeping with and using women, and he, he begins doing all of this, and you spend the whole film thinking, I wonder, I wonder where they got this idea. Who, who could have inspired such a film? I can't think of a single former England number eight with an epic voice who moonlights as a pundit and has very little insightful to say, and yet goes around coke all the time, in love with his own past career, cheating on his wife, there is... See, I... I thought I had it. I thought I knew where this film could have come from, where the seed could have come from, what could have inspired this film, but there's no scene in which Max Moore goes and spends 30k in a brothel. The film itself is entirely fine. It's an entirely functional London melodrama. It's a, the kind of film we'll all have seen on ITV in the evening so many times. There's one tale of, as we mentioned, a celebrity cheating on his wife, so his wife goes and cheats on him with the bloke from Weekend. There's a story of the guy from Wild Bill, which is lovely to see, I love seeing him on stuff, in stuff, he's, he's, he's great. He's a cabbie and he wants to have a kid, except he then has a tragic accident and it means he doesn't want to do a, ki a kid anymore. Um, there's some other stuff, there's a really lovely storyline with Franz Drum, who was in Tack the Block, and he's playing a kid who is serving out the last stretch of his community service by attending a grave alongside Ken Stott, and it's a really lovely heartfelt sequence that kind of, that's warm enough and actually kind enough to get you through the film. However, whilst the film only picks up after Max Moore has retired, there's still just about enough rugby in there to make it interesting for fans of anything other than average films in which people cry in the kitchen. We see a couple of shots, a couple of photos of Idris in an England shirt dotted around the film, dotted throughout. There's one scene in which Gemma Arterton goes in, and I'd love to put a clip behind my voice, I can't, I can't get a lot of footage for this. Gemma Arterton goes into the bedroom and she turns down all the photos of Max Moore after he's cheated on her. And one of the photos she turns down is just his squad photo from that year. Like, you know the ones that they do for the Six Nations when they just take a photo of everyone in the squad in their current shirt? Just that photo, which seems to imply, also, right, it's that year's England kit. The film was released in 2016, and it's the 2016 England kit Idris is wearing in every single shot of him wearing an English shirt in this film. Which seems to imply he's only just retired. Or that 
and this is the interesting thing, or that in this universe, kit technology is a few years ahead of where it is in real life, and therefore, and the England kit deal doesn't change that often, because they're still wearing the kit from the 2015 World Cup and 2016 Six Nations. Yeah, but that seems to, that, that also begs the question, though, of do England win the World Cup in 2003 in this universe? Because one of the big factors in the England World Cup, I don't mean to like belittle or everything else, but they were the first team to adopt the skin-tight rugby shirt. A lot of the teams in that World Cup, if you look at the quarterfinal against Wales, if you look at the final against Australia, they're still wearing baggy shirts that you can quite easily get hold of, whereas England are actually wearing skin-tight shirts. And I think that's it. It's always been a big factor. It was a lot of what Clive Woodward did was he found as many 1% as possible and he piled them all in. And that was actually probably 8 or 9%. So to England win the World Cup, if shirt technology is years ahead in this universe? I don't know, worth asking, worth, 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 worth questioning. But it also seems to imply, sorry, that thing about the squad photo, that Idris just goes every year. When the squad photo's done, he, take, he goes and prints it off, and then puts it up in his bedroom with his wife? Which, I don't know, I don't know any former internationals or current internationals to ask, but if any of you are out there, do you keep one of your squad photos from that year's Six Nations on the dressing table in your bedroom with your wife? Do you do that? Let me know, please. However, better yet, at the low point of the film, at the emotional low point for DJ Big Driss, he goes out, gets smashed, does loads of coke, because lol. And then afterwards he gets home, he collapses on the sofa, and he puts on the only Rugby Highlights compilation on YouTube without dubstep in the background. Now, I'd like to think if this film was made nowadays, there'd be a scene in which that video finishes and the next one on autoplay comes on. And it's one of my videos and it begins by calling him a twat, but that doesn't happen. Instead, we just get to see a brief moment of Idris Elba as former England rugby legend, Max Moore! playing rugby. And we get to see him wearing number eight, which is appropriate, you know, because very much you look at Idris Elba and you know he's a number eight. You kind of, you, you get that right way. Maybe a six, but primarily an eight. Except when we see him score a try at Twickenham, he puts the ball down like this, and then he just chucks it in the air in a fashion I haven't seen anyone do since the 70s. When was the last time you saw a proper hard man type number eight, like England rugby legend Max Moore? Put the ball down like that. He doesn't dive. Unfortunately, this is the only clip we get of Big Driss playing rugby. Of, of <laughs> but we do get to see a couple more rugby bits. We get to see him act as a pundit. And this also gives us a cameo by the one and only Johnny Medale. And Johnny Vidal, perfectly fine. He just does his job, he comes in, he does what he does. There is the problem that the test is being played at Twickenham, and Johnny Vidal works for the BBC, and all of England's home games are either on ITV or Sky, so Johnny Vidal wouldn't be covering that game. But otherwise, fine. However, that scene also gives us my favourite part of the film, because there's a cameo by former England scrum half, Kieran Bracken. Now, I don't know how many former England players you go through before the one you land on as your big celebrity cameo is Kieran Bracken. Especially because Ugo Monia also has a wordless cameo in the film. There's a scene in which Idris Elba's waiting outside a hotel, and Ugo Monia comes out, right? And Idris has been eyeing up these two ladies outside, and they leave with Ugo Monia instead. Because Monia steals a woman away from Idris goddamn Elba. Which, I don't mean there's any slight against Monia at all but he's literally Idris Elba. However, that doesn't get me away from the glorious point in the film where Kieran Bracken has to do improv. So the scene is, Max Moore is on TV, he's talking about rugby, it's half time, John Ivedell asks him about oh, what a great half that was, and he begins to respond, he begins to talk, except he's done so much cocaine that his nose begins to bleed and he runs off screen because he can't think of any intelligence to say, which would explain a lot if, if this film was based on anyone and they were doing commentary on cocaine so they weren't actually watching and paying attention, that would explain, that would explain quite a lot. But of course this film is based on anyone so I'm not, I'm not actually speculating about anything. 
So instead, as in the rock village and Max Moore runs outside, Johnny Vidal has to throw to Kieran Bracken to fill the space. And clearly, there isn't a line scripted for Bracken. He's just told to make something up and sound like he's doing punditry. And so what he says is, yes, well, uh, of course, we saw a great start. We saw England score inside the first minute. And then, clearly, as he rolls on, there's a bit where it cuts away and you kind of can't follow what you're saying. <laughs> and then we get a sense that clearly just let him go. And you get that thing, and I'm sure we've all had this, when you begin saying a sentence and you've got this kind of pressure on you. And so you just keep going and you keep embellishing and embellishing and embellishing. And so by the time we cut back to Bracken, this try has gone from being in the first minute, which actually Andre Jones now is is quite a common thing. Maybe he was just predicting the future. Maybe it was a, like a really accurate prediction of that All Blacks game or that game against Ireland last year. But instead, Kieran Bracken now is going, he's completely doubled down and he's saying, so of course we saw the quickest try I've ever seen in international rugby there. Um, you know, the quickest try in international rugby history was nine seconds by Scotland in 1999. Um, there was a try scored in Super Rugby in seven seconds in Australia. Um, but that means that Johnny Vidal didn't begin by saying, well, wasn't incredible. We saw a try inside the first six seconds. No, 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 no. He threw to England. Oh, and why wouldn't you? Because he is, he is a true England rugby legend. And he asks him just a generic question so that he can have a nosebleed. Now, I do really feel for Kieran Bracken because he is given a really tough job by the director. There's no lines there. He's just told to improvise. He's, you know, you're a pundit. You, you talk about this. But there's no game for him to talk about. He's just making it bollocks on the spot. And that's not always easy to do. He's been asked to commentate on a game that never happened, that never exists. He's making up every detail as he goes. And I find that quite funny. Frankly, that's what I want to see during this lockdown period. I want to see Kieran Bracken and other pundits commentate on games that didn't happen. Tell me what's happening this weekend as Gloucester play sale. That game isn't going ahead. That isn't happening. They're not really playing each other. But I want to know what's happening, according to Ugo Monia, Kieran Bracken and other stars of the film 100 Streets. It's harsh to pick on Bracken for it, but... Divorce of context, it is kind of funny. And speaking of divorce, segue. Gemma Arterton is perfectly good in the film. Idris Elba, perfectly good in the film. Everyone in it puts in like entirely good performances. Everything about the film is entirely solid. It's not especially memorable, the rugby segments aside. I probably would have forgotten it already if it hadn't been for the rugby bits. But everything, broadly speaking, slots together and works. It's an entirely okay movie. That's kind of where you come down on. It's the thing I realised when I started watching lots of films is that actually most films are average and this fits into that category really nicely. Also, refreshingly, it's only 91 minutes, which I've seen so many British movies like this that are over two hours long or about two hours long. And it's really refreshing to just see something that is 90 minutes long. It gets you there by the 90 minutes. You are watching right at the end Gemma Arterton <laughs> practice her spin passing, and I'm not gonna lie, it needs some work. She's not reverse spinning, but there's no there's no technique. Like it's strong as the wind that's taking that. That's, you're opening up to interception as well, it's too floaty, it's not it's not great. And then, and then, and I apologize for the quality of this, both from a <laughs> writing point of view and from a from a film in the footage point of view. But just when we think that we've got away with it. Just when we think film number two in the Squidge Rugby Film Club hasn't, isn't going to tell us that rugby is a gentleman's loaf of bread eaten by hooligans. It happens. The very last line of the film is this. We get a kid, he's gonna play rugby. Going for gentlemen, not hooligans. Another siren cuts the night in two. And then you realise there was a whole subplot about the cabbie character who's told that line, who listens to that line. There's a whole subplot about him coaching kids football. And it's entirely a setup so that we can hear that rugby is a gentleman's tree pruned by hooligans. Every time you think you've got away, it keeps pulling us back in. So last week, after we did all of this for the film Invictus, 
I asked you guys who would you cast in a sequel, in a follow-up, in a movie about Sia Khaleesi and the 2019 World Cup, but they made the same film in the same fashion. Who would you cast? I suggested Chadwick Boseman and Reese Witherspoon as Sia Khaleesi and Faf de Klerk, respectively, and Willem Dafoe as Razi Erasmus. Some suggestions that I've enjoyed. Now this is from Matty, who says, only one Hollywood actor could play Razi, Mark Ruffalo. And I like that. He's not got the physical presence of Erasmus, but you put him in stilettos, and he'd be up for that. Mark Ruffalo, Razzy Erasmus, I like it. Now, Colin Cairns, this is, whew, Sia as himself, done. I was at school with him. He's a natural. I see what you did there, Colin. I see you. There's an awful lot of people bringing up Chris Hemsworth as well. He's been cast as basically everyone, but Dwayne Vermeulen seems to be the most popular choice for him. Uh, ben L suggests that and also suggests Michael B. Jordan as you can you am. And now I quite like that. That's a clip and it's one of my favourite things. I've only saw it once on Twitter and I loved it and I haven't seen it since. Of Am standing there during the trophy parade afterwards and seeing all these kids are climbing on him. One of them's tugging on his beard and Am's just stood there with sunglasses on. Totally cool, not reacting. And for that alone, I think you've got to cast someone as effortless he calls Michael B. Jordan. I like that. Idris Elba comes up quite a lot as well. Quite a few people suggesting he should play the Beast, which I can't quite see. I think, frankly, he's perfectly cast as Long Stellario. Uh, Troy Grinley suggests Tarantino to do a movie about French rugby. Now, I like this plan. However, I don't quite think Quentin Tarantino's style is violent enough to cover the pro up. Robert O'Connor says Danny DeVito with Eddie Jones. Justin Oswald says a sentient meat pie as Franz Marherba. Now, Chad Kenny makes a really good suggestion in Jason Momoa should play one of these South African second rowers. However, he says even Ezebeth. I think R.J. Snyman is the obvious casting there. He also suggests Kevin Hart as Cheslin Colby, which would be mental. Can you imagine? As Colby crosses the try line, he stops, puts the ball down and goes off on one about how short he is. He does a full routine in a high-pitched voice. That would be excellent. I want him to go because he would be. He wouldn't get into character. He would just wear a scrum cap and go full Kevin Hart. That would be hysterical. Salty Spaceman says, the ginger guy from Harry Potter, Stephen Kitshoff. I like the fact that you couldn't even remember Ron Weasley. I, I appreciate that. Also, he needs to pile on quite a lot of pounds. He needs to down everything from that ice cream truck he famously bought. There's an interesting point from Amnesia Tomorrow, which I think we're all suffering from right now. A young Liam Neeson would have made a perfect Francois Pina. I, I think that's absolutely spot on. He would have been excellent. Uh, and Owen Burns, I think this is a good place to leave it, says Matt Lucas as Dan Cole slash Rombies. Sorry, I mispronounced his name. It's probably pronounced. <laughs> so, on that note, I'd like next week if anyone could go in the exact opposite direction. In the way, I watched this film, 100 Streets, and thought to myself, you know what? Idris Elba would make a really handy number eight. If you could sign any big Hollywood man in that way to your team, to whoever you support, who would it be? And then next week, the next one I'm going to be covering is a film I've been wanting and trying to see for, that was less smooth than I thought it would be, for, for a very long time. Now, I heard whisperings, I heard legends of a Welsh Kiwi movie called Old Scores year, years ago, and I finally saw it this week. The plot of the film is the touch judge from a famous game from 1966, which Wales beat the All Blacks, says on his deathbed, that actually he cheated and the Welsh wing who scored the winning try stepped into touch. So they have to replay the game with all of the people, all of the players from the original fixture who are now in like their 50s and 60s going back out and playing again. It's daft, it's stupid, it's fun, and it's on YouTube right now. I'll put a link in the description if anyone wants to watch it. Hopefully it doesn't get taken down during this week. Fingers crossed. But please send me any thoughts on that and please send me your thoughts on who you'd want to sign and I'll see you next week to talk about old scores.